Hi, my name is Kai Brünler and I'm going to talk about uh, some work that we did towards verifying the Bitcoin S library. That is work uh, that I did together with um, two of our students at Bernie University of Applied Sciences, Ramon Boss and Anna Dukma. <clears throat> So first, I'm going to talk about <clears throat> the library that we're, of which we're trying to verify some properties. That's Bitcoin S, that's a Scala implementation of some basic uh, Bitcoin functionality. Um, then I'm going to talk about Stainless. Stainless is the verification tool that we use in order to verify uh, properties of the software. Now, Stainless only works on a subset of Scala and doesn't, uh, doesn't support all of the language features of Scala, just a subset, which is called pure Scala. And so in order to use Stainless, we had to rewrite parts of Bitcoin S uh, for Stainless, so in this pure Scala fragment. So I'm going to talk about that. And in the end, I will talk about some bugs that we found in the process. So first, Bitcoin S. So in Bitcoin S, you can, um, well, you can serialize and deserialize Bitcoin transactions, generate private keys, uh, sign Bitcoin transaction, check that Bitcoin transactions fulfill certain properties. <clears throat> Here's just some code to give you a feel of what you can do. So um, you can uh, generate a private key. Um, you can generate, uh, you can generate a, a log script using the public key that belongs to the private key. You can uh, create an amount of Satoshis, 10,000 Satoshis. You can create a transaction output, which is locked by that uh, log script uh, um, and which contains these 10,000 Satoshis. And finally, you can create a transaction which, um, um, which produces this or has this output and has a, an empty list of inputs. Of course, that won't work unless it's a coin-based transaction. Um, so this is just some, some code to illustrate things that you can do with Bitcoin S. Yes. Stainless um, is a tool with which you can, um, you can annotate Scala code with uh, preconditions and postconditions, and finally verify that. So here's an example um, of a factorial function, and this factorial function is annotated with, uh, with a precondition. So it requires that the n, the, the argument to the factorial function, is greater than zero. And it's also annotated with a postcondition. So this says that um, for each call of this function, if the precondition is, is satisfied, then the postcondition is also satisfied, which is that the result is greater than zero. So if the input to the factorial function is greater than zero, then the result uh, of the factorial function is also greater than zero. Um, now, what you um, maybe you already see that this is not the case. So this um, this verification will fail because um, integer. So the int type in Scala that's just the int type of Java, and the int type of Java overflows. So it's uh, 64 bit, I think. And uh, if you reach the maximum integer for uh, 64 bits, uh, this will overflow. So this will uh, actually return a negative, uh, uh, a negative result. And this is exactly what stainless tells us when we call it with that function. So it gives us a counterexample, it gives us a counterexample for n, which is 17. So it tells us, you know, if you call this function with 17, then your um, precondition is satisfied, but the postcondition is not satisfied. So it's invalid, and that's bad, obviously. So um, the good thing is that we found a counterexample, right? So it's buggy. We know there is a bug in the software and so we can fix it. And the fix in this case would, for example, be to replace the int type by the big int type. In that case, the verification would succeed. So that is how you use stainless. 
Um, now, stainless, as I said, doesn't support all of Scala. It supports a subset of Scala that's called pure Scala, and that's essentially algebraic data types and pure functions, so recursive, recursively defined functions on those algebraic data types. Algebraic data types are case classes in, in Scala. Um, it's not exactly true, so it also supports some imperative features, but that's actually not relevant for this, uh, for, for this work here, because none of the uh, parts of, of Bitcoin S that we look at have any imperative features. So uh, the things that it does not include, the things that are not included in pure Scala are actually the things that are relevant for, for, for our work. And that is inheritance by objects. So objects in pure Scala, they cannot inherit uh, uh, from, from other classes. Um, objects are not really objects. They cannot have state. Um, they are just, um, they're just meant to group functions and, and uh, uh, data types. So they're more like namespaces in, in stainless. So inheritance by objects is not supported. Um, abstract type members are not supported. Uh, inner classes in case objects are not supported. So there are, so these are just three examples of, there are actually 10, um, 10 Scala language features that we have in the paper that are not supported by, uh, by pure Scala, not supported by stainless. Um, and they have nothing to do with, uh, in, they're not imperative, well, yeah. They're not supported. So, um, so what we have to do uh, in actually, uh, so Bitcoin S uses these features. And if we want to verify the code, then we have to rewrite the code uh, in, in pure Scala, essentially. So um, let's talk about this. So there are three examples. Um, well, the first is very easy. So um, we have an object Satoshi's and you know um, it um, you have a zero and you have a one now you might ask why is this so complicated why can't i just use let's say an integer or an big in for satoshis um, and the reason is the reason is that that's a peculiarity of consensus code so if you write consensus code you have to be in agreement with the majority and the majority is running the um, the Bitcoin core client, the Bitcoin core client is written in C++. And so Bitcoin S has to be in perfect agreement with the C++ implementation, with the reference implementation. So what Bitcoin S does in order to achieve this is it re-implements C, C++ data types in Scala. So for example, the, the C type in 64T is re-implemented in um, in Scala. So that's this int64 type here. So that's why the, um, let's say the implementation in, of Bitcoin S is maybe not as straightforward as you might expect. Um, so anyway, we have an object here that uh, inherits from some other class and that's not allowed. But in this case, it's not a problem. So this, uh, uh, this object doesn't have any, any state. So we can just turn it into a case object and then it's fine, right? So case objects, they have some additional properties. Um, for example, they are serializable, but that doesn't bother us, doesn't, doesn't uh, change uh, our code. Um, the second example is uh, abstract type members. So we have this abstract class currency unit and it has an abstract type A, um, well, the underlying representation, let's say, of that currency unit. And um, this is then overwritten in the Satoshi's class where you overwrite the type A with uh, in 64, so the underlying uh, is represented as a as a 64-bit integer. Um, that is not supported by by stainless, so we just remove the um, the the abstract type. It's not a problem because the only um, the only thing our code ever instantiates this type A with is in 64. So we just remove the abstract type and replace it by in 64. That's that's easy. 
Um, and finally, the, the third uh, example of a, of a transformation we did is um, there's a check result function. And what it does is it checks for overflows. Um, and the way it does this is it takes, um, well, the result of some operation and it does a bitwise and with an end mask. And the end mask is just uh, 64 bits, let's say, of ones, 64 ones or FFFF, whatever. So um, if the result is actually larger than 64 bits, then um, you should get uh, something else than the original result. And um, then this function would fail. So this here is, this requires actually not something we introduced as a precondition. Um, this is uh, an assertion, it's like an assertion. So if this code is executed at runtime, this require statement will throw an exception that um, if, the, if, the, uh, if this condition isn't true. So that's an overflow check or an intended overflow check. We'll see that it's buggy, but yeah. Now it turns out that, uh, oh well, actually this, so this bitwise and uh, function, that's a problem um, because stainless doesn't support the bitwise and. So stainless has, um, has a big integer type and this big integer type doesn't support uh, bitwise operations. So the bitwise operations in Scala, they're just, um, they're just the bitwise operations on the big integer of Java. And so there's no Scala implementation of that. Um, and so uh, there, there's, there's, yeah, this is not supported by, by stainless. Um, so, so we cannot verify this, this code uh, uh, in, in, in stainless. Now it turns out that, un uh, that fortunately, this check result function is completely redundant. So the only places where this check result function was called um, were places where other checks ensured that, uh, uh, that the that this result is is not overflowing, so we could actually remove that. We could remove that that function entirely, and um, th this way we were able to to verify to to uh, give this code to stainless. So um, there are a couple more transformations that I'm I'm not going to talk about here, but they're they're in the paper. Um, and finally, we uh, we have our specification here. So the thing that we verified is that if you add zero Satoshis to an existing amount of Satoshis, you get the original amount of Satoshis, um, which is of course something that you would want. Um, so we add a precondition which says that the Satoshis that you're adding are zero. And then we had a post condition that then the amount of Satoshis that you're adding to uh, stays the same. Yeah. And now since we transformed all the other code into the fragment that's supported by stainless, we can actually run stainless on this and stainless will tell us that the post condition is verified. So no matter uh, how you call this code, um, you will always, if you had zero Satoshis to an amount of Satoshis, get your original amount of Satoshis. Originally we wanted to uh, prove something more interesting, like something that, uh, for example, that no uh, transaction that is, that passes the check transaction function of Bitcoin S creates new money. So um, that would be something more substantial, something more interesting to verify. But it turned out that this code relies on uh, less than 1,500 lines of code, which again liberally use uh, features outside of the pure fragment of Scala. So uh, we we couldn't manage to to verify that. Okay, so now. It's not particularly interesting uh, uh, to verify this property, right? And even the more uh, 
more, let's say, ambitious property uh, to verify wouldn't be of much interest to the Bitcoin S uh, authors. Um, but what they care about a lot is bugs. And uh, we found set two bugs uh, during the course of this work. And the first bug is that, so there is a check transaction function and um, which does some basic checks on a transaction. And for example, what it is supposed to check is that if you have two inputs and these two inputs refer to, a same, to the same output of a previous transaction, then that is not allowed, right? So the inputs, there should be no duplicate input. There shouldn't be two inputs that refer to the same output. Um, but what they were in, in fact checking is that what they checked is that there are no two inputs that refer to the same transaction which is of course something that is possible. So you can have two, you should be able to have a transaction with two inputs that refer to two different outputs of the same transaction. So that should be possible. And that wasn't. So in fact, this, this check was too restrictive and we replaced it by the correct check. So that's a pull request that is, uh, was accepted at Bitcoin. And the second thing we found is, I already hinted at it, is that the check result function is buggy. So it's redundant, thank God, but it's also buggy. So it doesn't actually check the result. And the reason is that the and, the bitwise and function of Java big integers um, does something that's called assign, assign extension. So, um, and the sign extension essentially leads uh, to the fact that this, this check never fails, right? So no matter how much you overflow, the overflow will never be detected because the, uh, the Java on N Scala, a bitwise integer, a bitwise and function on big integers, um, essentially it, it pads the smaller of the two arguments with ones until it matches the length of the of the of the larger argument and then does does the bitwise end. So we removed the uh, the check result function entirely, and this is the because that's of course dangerous, right? You you think that something is being checked, while in fact it isn't checked. Um, so this is the second bug that we found and we fixed. So, lessons learned. Um, lesson number one, even verifying very simple properties requires significantly rewriting existing Scala code. So, um, and this is true even for purely functional code, right? So, um, the, the code we looked at, there, were no, there was no state, no mutable state, but still a lot of it was outside of the, of the uh, fragment that Stainless supports. Um, so we can't really verify existing code. What we really verify is a re-implementation of it. So that's lesson number three. But lesson number four is attempting to verify has been very useful for finding bugs. And that is something that the authors of uh, the software care about much more than verifying properties. So thank you very much for listening.